Our first message this afternoon is from Mr. Art Williams. It is entitled, Traveling the Road to Better Promises. Art. Thank you, Ron. Perhaps a better title would have been uh, Traveling the Road of Life to Better Promises. I like using the analogy of road to life. I've used it before, I guess. Roads can be of very many varieties, dirty, dusty, gravel, a lot of road, uh, stones and pebbles. Could be paved with asphalt. All of them have potholes, concrete can be cracked. Some with hills and curves and potholes and detours and out, bridges that are out. Of course, there's always animals that run onto the roads too and other hazards. But there's not only those kinds of roads, but there's also airways and there are sea lanes. And there's a person who had a dream, a hope, to go on a cruise. Never been on a cruise before, but never had the money or the time. And she prayed about it and had the opportunity. It manifested itself, great price, 50% normal cost. She had the time to do it. Everything looked great. So she booked it. And it was four days to the first port of call. And on the second day, and they were all aware of this, that they were going to have a drill for the emergency procedures on the boat. So if something did happen, you would know what to do, where to go, and how to proceed. And sure enough, on the second day, the emergency alarm went off. No particular alarm. Everybody thought it was a drill. That is, until the captain came on the intercom and said, it's unfortunate, but we had an accident, and the, the integrity of the hull of the ship has been compromised, and we are going to be sinking in about 40 minutes. And the collateral damage has resulted in the lifeboats not being able to be deployed. So everybody got a bit nervous, but he did follow it up and say, we have contacted rescue ships, and they should be with, here within about 30 minutes. So there she is, bobbing around in this warm water, not too bad, with a life vest on, trying to stay close to the boat and everybody else. And then what you would think would happen happened. Sees this dorsal fin coming through the water, weaving its way slowly and inexorably right towards her. Gets close enough and then it starts going around her, just like you always read about or hear about. She feels its tail swipe along her leg. And she's envisioning herself being come shark food. When all of a sudden, a head pops out of the water. It's a dolphin. And the dolphin starts doing the dolphin chatter, you know. And then something else weird happens. It says, climb on my back and I'll take you to the nearby island and rescue you. So she climbs on the back of the dolphin. He takes off and goes to the nearest island. She gets off in the shallow water, the dolphin takes, takes off, she wades ashore. Well, it ha the cruise hasn't worked out exactly the way she had planned it. But it, I guess since the dolphin brought me here, this must be a safe island. So she wades uh, onto the island and she sees a welcoming sign. And it says, welcome to Cannibal Island. Well, that doesn't sound too, too good. Let's see what happens here. So she goes walking along the beach, and it wasn't too long, and a couple, she sees a couple of guys coming along in loincloths, and they say, hey, hi, how are you? Hey, why don't you come on back to our camp? We want to have you for dinner. <clears throat> hmm. Now she goes with them, and she gets back to their camp, and she sees a, the typical big, black pot, you know, with a fire underneath it. And about that time, she's about had enough of Cannibal Island. And she says, I'm getting out of here. He lets out a scream and takes off running back toward the ocean. The guy says, hey, come back, come back. Don't run away. We want you. And she's running faster than ever until she gets back to the ocean. She dives into the water. 
She doesn't hear the cannibals, what they say. She dives in the water, swimming away as fast as she can. And one cannibal looks at the other and says, you know, I was really hoping she would tell us about her Christian God. It's been so long since we haven't heard anything about it. Anyway, she exhausts herself swimming. Finally, she's going down for the third time. And as she goes under, all of a sudden, she wakes up from her dream, soaking wet in sweat. The bed covers are all a mess. And she's rocking back and forth like this. And she thinks she's still in the ocean. Then she realizes it's a water bed. <laughs> That's an analogy just to a road that we might travel down in our life. Things don't always work out. Things that appear to be perhaps hazardous aren't. The two cannibals were actually friendly, and they wanted to hear about the Christian religion, but because of her own fears, uh, she couldn't take up advantage of that. In Hebrews 7, 18 and 19, it says, For on one hand there is a knowing of the former commandment because of its weaknesses and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the beginning, bringing in of a better hope, through which we draw near to God. In continuing verse 22, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant, our guarantee, our foundation. And in Hebrews 8, 6, that now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises Better promises compared to what? Better promises compared to what was given to ancient Israel. We all know the history of ancient Israel. I went through it a little bit the last time I spoke. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Paul writes, Now all these things happened to them as examples, as they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Israel was to be a model nation before the world. And we know that. You can read it back in Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8. I'm not going to go there. Um, the part that I do want to focus is on verse 9, Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and here's, here's the fly in the ointment. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren. So now this is to be a perpetual thing going on generation after generation after generation. What do you think would happen if you made an agreement with your children and said, look, it, I want you to do this all of your life, and I want you to see that your children's children do it, and I want you to see that your children's children's children do it. <clears throat> what do you think the probability of success is going to be? Tough road to hoe. And we know the history of ancient Israel. They re fell away, they repented, fell away, and repented, fell away. And finally it came in 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 12. I don't know if I'll read all of it. Maybe, maybe we will. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramoth and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So Israel went from being an example and a leader of what a nation should be with par partnering with God to wanting to be like the other nations, to be a follower. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have reject not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. And he goes down in verse 11, if we can jump down there, and he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. And he gives them a brief description of what the king would do, verses 12 through 17. It's really, I guess, astounding in my little mind how when you have a God that will fight your battles for you and you want to be like the other nations and go out and suffer all the things that they suffer. And I... In writing this, I, often, I wondered, 
What would have happened on December 7, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor, if on December 8th, the great curator God came down and said, no, no, don't go to war on these people. I will take care of it for you. What have we said? No, we want to do it. They killed my brother. They killed my son. I want to do it. I don't want you to do it. Would we have said that? I wonder. Do men want to have the glory of war, the pomp and circumstance, the band playing, and the deceitfulness of the glory that think they will heap upon themselves? Of course, the ones that are wounded and maimed for life don't share that glory, perhaps physically, mentally, and emotionally. They don't share that glory. The origins of Hell's Angels, you know, came about as a result of veterans that couldn't readjust to society after the war. So they did what they had to do to be able to survive and how they could adjust. And he goes on in 1 Samuel 8.18, and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. So because they make that decision not to partner with God, he's going to say, okay, you're on your own. And some of the kings that Israel had turned out to be all right. Most of them were not. And perhaps the best, may, may I shouldn't say that, one of the best of the good kings, we can read about in 2 Chronicles 35, 1824. There had been no Passover kept in Israel like since the days of Samuel the prophet, and none of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as Josiah kept. With the priests and the Levites, all Judah and Israel who were present, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, this Passover was kept. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates. And Josiah went out against them. But he sent messengers to him, saying, What have I have to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day but against the house with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Refrain from meddling with God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Josiah did not listen. And it's really, in one, in one way, you know, you can understand it. Because Josiah understood what happened with Moses, I'm sure, and, and Egypt. Maybe he didn't believe. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's read the rest of this. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself so he might fight with him. And did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God. So he came to fight in the valley of Medigo. And the archers shot King Josiah, Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am severely wounded. His servants therefore took him out of the chariot and put him in a second chariot that he had and brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers, and all Jer Judah and Jerusalem mourned. Why did he go out to fight? He had a number of options. Perhaps he didn't believe that the other king had God with him and was telling him the truth. Perhaps he had an, uh, an alliance with the individual or the nation that was going to be attacked, and he felt he had to keep it. But he had the option of sending for a prophet and asking God, what shall I do? All things that we can learn from in our life, things to consider when we go about our own lives, we can learn from this. The blessings and the purposes for ancient Israel that were never realized, they fell away. And after unlimited patience, he had had enough, and he dissolved them. And the interesting thing happens is that the beginning of the kingdom of God starts with the death of Jesus. Before the punishment of 25, 20 years, 
were concluded. Probably one of the most telling, most strenuous evangelisms ever done was that of Paul. You read through all the things that he suffered. Uh, the shipwrecks, the snake bites, the beatings, trying, people trying to kill him. And he says in Philippians 1, verse 12, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Usually we can look back on things and see that. At the time that they're happening, it's hard to uh, realize that. Like with our, with our young gal that went on her trip and the cannibals wanted to hear about Christ and she thought they were wanting to have her for dinner. But the punishment eventually concluded, and when the punishments concluded, the blessing started. And it's interesting if you read back in Exodus 35, 35, the skills that God gave to the workmen. He has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and a tapestry maker in blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen and of the weaver those who do every work and those who design artistic works. He gave them those skills. And with the blessings that once again started after the 25, 20 years, did he also give them skills? You know, if you talk with some of the technology people today, they seem to have a real, just, just like somebody might have a talent in playing an instrument or doing art or uh, singing, some of these guys seem to have an art, a special skill or ability to see their way through this stuff. And you ought to wonder if it's not given to them by him. And which of the great inventions that were perhaps given by the creator for his purposes? Take example of the printing press. Gutenberg invented that, right? No, no. The earliest printing press <clears throat> It was actually in China, and it printed up a document called the Diamond Sutra, and it was 8, 868 AD during the Tang Dynasty. But the interesting thing is that nothing ever happened with it. Here they had this great medium to produce typewritten information, and nothing happened with it. But when Gutenberg comes out with it, he influenced the whole world. And the same thing with Columbus. Discovered America, right? No, there were already people living in America. Native people, they discovered America, but nothing ever happened with it. Columbus came, didn't really land on the continent, but it influenced the world. It was a starting point. The model nations with blessings of riches and certain level of fairness and equality has been fulfilled, is being fulfilled, as attested to by all the immigrants that want to come to the various countries around the world for a better life, better than their own country. But all these blessings don't eliminate the inherent evil of carnal man, nor the influence of Satan. And it goes back even to the earliest days of our own country, with the Continental Army of George Washington in Valley Forge perishing from lack of food, clothing, and shelter, George Washington went to the Congress seeking help and support. Later he wrote in his memoirs, it seems the Congress is more interested in making money in the black market than they are in creating a new nation. Carnal man's own lusts, the influence of evil, satanic influence, is not eradicated by physical blessings. I don't know if it was last year or a year before, there were 15,000 murders in the United States alone. And that can explodes out to all the grieving families, husband and wives, father, mother, sons and daughters, 
and it'll repeat again next year with a lesser, perhaps more magnitude. And then there's sex trafficking, rape, kidnapping, extortion, robbery, burglary, and not only in America, but around the world. I hope none of us feel that's okay as long as it doesn't happen to me because there are people out there that have that attitude. I'm living my middle class, upper middle class life, my American dream. I'm untouched by this stuff. I'm having a great time here. Uh, they'll work it out, you know, they'll, they'll work it out. But it's not only America, it's Kenya, it's Burma, it's Indonesia, and other distant places around the world. But he also has, I believe, his own purpose in blessing the nation, and that is to get the evangelism of the world complete. Much of the evangelism of the world today is seated in America, or originated here, and with the means that are not avail now available, it's really hard to stop it from going all around the world. So what's the purpose of Christianity? And what's the result of the fulfillment of that purpose? When did the building, the creating of the kingdom of God start? Well, the purpose of Christianity, the purpose of the church, we know is to spread the gospel, make con converts. But there's a greater purpose, and those converts are going to rule the thousand years for, with Jesus. So the building of the kingdom of God starts with conversion of individual people. The individual people that will be ruling with Jesus. The opportunity started with the death and resurrection of our Savior. And that is the foundation of the kingdom of God and was put in that place at that time. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The development, the building, the creating of the kingdom of God is going on right now and has been going on for quite some time. And he's taking these people as they grow and maybe they start off as a gatekeeper and maybe today they rule, he's erased their name and put them up to ruling over five cities. Maybe ruling over a nation. But before we get there, he's going to clean up the world. There are some bad times coming because he's building and creating the beginning of his kingdom right now. And then he's going to go out there and he's going to clean up the whole messy world. And then he's going to bring it back with his government. But that cleaning up of the world isn't a good time. As a matter of fact, name is 5, 18 through 20. He says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it to you? For the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned on his hand on the wall, and a servant bit him. In Lamentations, Jeremiah cried over Jerusalem. And in Matthew 23, verses 37 and 39, Jesus does the same. And he moans the fact, well, let's, uh, let's read about what Jesus says here. Verse 34, Matthew 23. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, <coughs> the son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. He's speaking here about the destruction of Jerusalem that was going to happen shortly after his death, about 70 AD. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
you that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered your children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wing and you would not. Behold, your house is left desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. It's kind of like having two children. One of them loves his parents and wants to please his parents and does everything he can. Every once in a while he you know, throws a baseball through the house window or burns down the family garage or something. But it's not intentional, you know. The other one, he's out to get whatever he can. He lies to his parents. He goes out and does things that he shouldn't be doing and his parents ends up hearing about it from the school teachers. It's kind of about the same, same, same type of analogy. But there are better times coming. In Luke 12, 2, he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. And again, there is the place that the people that are converted today will be to rule over cities, nations, to be a pillar in the temple of God, to teach, to be an emissary to nations, to regulate and rule over all the physical creation and to judge physical and spiritual beings. In John 17, 6, he writes, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Continuing in verse 8, For I have given to them the words which you have given to me, and they have received them. They have received them. The others would not receive them. They did not want to hear it. And have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Belief, a key element in Christian faith, but there's more to it we'll see in a minute. Continuing in verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Future believers, that's us today, and those of tomorrow and further out and beyond that they may all be one as you, Father, and, and are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me a witness before the world, those that would not hear. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We see in Hebrews 6, verses 9 through 12, <clears throat> But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Let me read that again. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, faith, belief. Verse 12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise, the better promises. You know, there's a, there's a downside to all of this in that we can't candy coat the word of God 
I have a Bible at home that does that. You know, the latest Bible I bought, which was about three years ago. When it comes to anything that's negative, it's just like they took scissors and cut it out of there. You look for fire, brimstone, hell. You're not going to find it. But it's, you know, it's given to help us, to let us know there is a possibility of running off the road into the ditch. I mean, I, if I may digress a little bit, I, when I grew up in the church, I was under the, the gun of fear-mongering end-time alarmism. And for someone graduating high school and everybody saying six years later the earth is going to blow up, you don't have much of a future, do you? And it really rides on your mind. Why should I do anything? What am I going to do with it? And frankly, I don't remember now how I ever fought my way through it. But somehow I put it to the side and went on with life, and it's a good thing I did. Had I decided that, well, Jesus is coming in six years, the day the Lord's going to be here, and everything's going to blow up, I probably would have just stayed home, ate grapes, and waited for the year to come. <laughs> you know? But that's the negative part of it. You, 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 you get scared. You start not believing. Uh, you doubt yourself. You doubt God's love. You think that you're inadequate. And you have to do something more. Because if something goes wrong in your life, like the ship sinks when you're on a cruise, oh, but God answered my prayer and told me I'm supposed to go on this cruise. Paul didn't worry about it, did he? He said he was supposed to preach in Rome. So when they got in the storm, he told them beforehand, we shouldn't take this trip now. The weather's going to be bad. They did anyway. They sunk. On, you know, and he tells them, don't worry. It's all going to be all right. Don't put the lifeboat on down. They're starting to put the lifeboat down if you read the story. He said, don't do that. Get rid of that. Stay on the ship. You'll all be fine. Then they finally listened to him. But we can make mistakes by fear-mongering incorrectly, incorrectly using the admonitions, the, the, the warnings that are there. There probably is a place for fear religion as long as it, people can grow out of it and it's not the modus operandi. <clears throat> he says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The parable of the talents. I'm not going to read through that whole thing, but the, the bottom line on verse 30 is, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So those admonitions, those warnings are there. So we can look at them, read them and see is there any aspect in our life that might put us into one of these categories. Perhaps 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 might be a, a bigger risk for most of us old timers because you get familiar with things and you begin to take things for granted, you lose the fire in the belly, and you end up having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And from such people turn away. Again, we have the awareness of that and we can do something about it. He wants us to willingly desire to follow his way, his laws, his morals, his ethics, without the threat of death. You know, you see in some of the movies, the guy brings out a gun and says, you're going to do this or else I'm going to shoot you. And so the guy does it, and it's the old adage, a mind, man's mind changed against his will is of the same opinion still. <clears throat> but in the end, it kind of comes down to that. Because in the end, 
He places before a rebellious mankind the choice, accept my rule or die the first death. But that's not what he wants from us. He wants us voluntarily to be loving him, willing to follow him, trusting him, even if the ship sinks, even if the cannibals are chasing us. And Paul had a tremendous positive outlook in the things that he writes, and he says, Philippians 1, 12 through, let's see, 12 through, let's go through 20, I guess. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has come, become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak out, to speak the word without fear. There's a lot said in the Bible about not fearing. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. Some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed to, for the defense of the Gospels. <clears throat> Continuing in 18, what then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preaching, I therein do rejoice and will rejoice. So even when enemies talk about Christ and what is being done in the church, they are getting his name out there. Continuing in verse 19, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But, and I'll finish with this last verse. According to my earnest expectations and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, no fear here, as always, so now also Christ shall magnify, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. 